It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. You're listening to us in your neighborhood, from coast to coast, and around the world. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Joan Herman, author, speaker, and your host. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life brings you interviews with some of the most inspirational and influential people in the world. It's our goal to educate and empower you so you can live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. We have another great show for you today. Joining me is award-winning ABC News anchor Dan Harris, who's here to talk about how he learned to quiet the voice inside his head so he could reduce stress and be happier while succeeding in an extremely competitive profession. Dan is co-anchor of ABC News Nightline and co-anchor for the weekend edition of Good Morning America. He contributes to 2020, World News with Diane Sawyer, and the weekday edition of GMA. He is the author of the book, 10% Happier, How I Tame the Voice in My Head, Reduce Stress Without Losing My Edge, and Found Self-Help That Actually Works. Welcome, Dan. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Dan, I'm happy that you're here. Your book addresses what the type A skeptics of the world believe. So you offer hope to the millions who are literally making themselves sick. Dan, you're a broadcast journalist at the top of your game. You've covered wars and presidential campaigns. Every day is a new competition for you to just stay in the game. So it makes sense that you'd be a wound tight, stressed out type A individual whose mind never stops. But you needed to make it stop. You had to make some major changes in your life. As an investigative reporter, you began a quest to learn about the self-help movement. Why did you begin this journey? What was your life like and what were you experiencing? Well, what what kicked it off was uh, having a panic attack on national television. About 10 years ago, in 2004, I was on Good Morning America anchoring the news updates, uh, and uh, I I had a panic attack. I couldn't breathe, uh, my heart was racing, and my palms were sweating. I I was unable to continue speaking. And I had to quit right in the middle of my little newscast, and obviously that was very scary and also very embarrassing. And and I later found out that the cause of the panic attack was drug uh, abuse. I was uh, I had been using cocaine and ecstasy um, recreationally, largely uh, to compensate for some depression that I developed after coming home from uh, covering wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and Israel and, and Palestine. And um, so that was obviously a pretty, pretty complex stew of events. And when I put it all together and realized what had gone wrong, I, I knew I had to make some changes in my life. Interestingly, though, that was not enough to really set me on the road to getting my act together. It was There was another thing that happened that kind of kicked it off as well, which is that my boss at the time, Peter Jennings, assigned me to cover religion for ABC News. And I am not a religious guy. I was raised in a very secular environment. And I didn't want to do this beat at first, but as it turned out, it was a great thing for me. And, and as, a, as a consequence of uh, covering religion uh, and and having had this panic attack, I ended up stumbling upon um, meditation, which I always thought was uniquely ridiculous, but it turned out to be very valuable for me. Well, you were a skeptic when you began this journey, and and it's interesting that you said you thought it to be ridiculous because so many type A personalities think it is, you know, that hoo-hoo-y type of thing for hippie culture. So going in as a skeptic, what did you learn? Well, let me just say, first of all, I think it's completely natural for for people to be skeptical about meditation. It suffers from a huge PR problem, and the way it's talked about in our culture is really annoying. Um, and so most of us assume that, that the only people who do meditation are hippies and weirdos and freaks and people who live in a yurt and are really into Cat Stevens and aromatherapy and ultimate frisbee. And, uh, and, that, and I understand why people feel that way, because I certainly felt that way. Um, and I, what's missing is people who are out there talking about meditation without any of the unfortunate cultural baggage. So what I'm trying to do is to strip away the cultural baggage and talk about it simply for what it is. And what it is is simple brain exercise. And uh, and when I say simple, I mean, it's really simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple, uncomplicated, secular, 
exercise for your brain, and there's an enormous amount of science that suggests that it can do extraordinary things for you, from lowering your blood pressure to boosting your immune system to literally rewiring key parts of your brain for happiness and compassion uh, and calm and well-being. And uh, so when I learned all of that, uh, that I didn't have to join a group or believe in anything or wear special outfits or sit in a funny position or anything like that, and that there was all of this science, that's what allowed me to jump in and give it a shot. Were you able to make it work in the beginning? I know you started with five excruciating minutes as you describe it. So when someone wants to try this and the mind wanders all over the place, a lot of times people give up. So what do you recommend to stay on the path? I would say the mind wandering all over the place is meditation. That is, that is, it's like when somebody comes up, to, imagine if somebody came up to you at the gym and said, I'm sweating and panting. I don't know if, I'm, if I can exercise. That is exercise, <laughs> right? When you sit down and try to meditate, your mind is going to go berserk, but mm -hmm. that's the nature of the mind. Uh, if it was easy, you wouldn't have to meditate. If you were in naturally great shape all the time, you wouldn't have to work out. So uh, the point isn't to somehow stop thinking, which is impossible if, unless you're dead or enlightened. The point is to learn how to have the grit to get lost and start again and get lost and start again and get lost and start again. And that, every time you do that, you're doing a bicep curl for your brain and you are literally changing the, the, the connections in your brain when you try to focus on one thing at a time, usually your breath and find that your mind goes crazy and you're thinking about what am I going to have for lunch, why did I say that stupid thing to my boss, um, and then you catch yourself and return your attention to your breath. Doing that over and over again breaks a lifetime of habit of walking around in a fog of projecting into the future or ruminating about the past, and it can change your entire life. Is it easy? Absolutely not. But when you go to the gym, and you should think about this like exercise for your brain, when you go to the gym, if it's easy, you're cheating. Same thing with meditation. So, Dan, once you began meditating, you actually completed a silent retreat. What was that like for someone who talks for a living, who, you know, words, that's your life. How were you able to survive 10 days of non-talking? The not talking was not the hard part. Uh, <laughs> I, there was nobody there that I really wanted to talk to anyway. And I'm, I'm I don't know, the, the idea of being silent didn't scare me. What, what scared me was meditating all day, every day for 10 days in a, like, alongside like a pack of weirdos. So I, I was very much did not want to do it. Uh, I was talked into it by some uh, meditation friends of mine. And also at that point, I knew I was going to write this book. So it seemed like it uh, might, might be a good thing to do for my research. I, I want to, I'll tell you more about it in just a second, but I want to add one caveat because I don't want your listeners to think that if they start meditating, the only way to do it right is to go off on a 10 day silent meditation retreat. Um, that, that is not, I, I did this because I was at that point getting very, very interested in meditation and wanted to write a book. But I think doing five minutes a day is enough. And uh, my whole game is to, is to take away all of your excuses. And so I'm always on the lookout for any excuse that – because your, your mind, the way the mind of your skeptical listener is going to work is they're just going to be constantly looking for ways to get out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm in, throughout the course of this interview going to try to remove any excuses you might have. So having said all of that, the, the 10 days was miserable until it became unbelievable. And there's something about the nature of the mind where you – if you sit and try to focus on one thing all day long, you will – eventually get dragged kicking and screaming into the present moment in a really big way where the mind slows down enough, the thinking slows down enough that you're really tasting your food and smelling the air and feeling the breeze and hearing the birds in the trees. And that is accompanied by a big blast of serotonin often. And so I had a period of time in the middle of that retreat that was probably the happiest moment of my life. Um, and then it went back to being hard again. Uh, but I absolutely think it was worth it, and I've gone off and done other retreats subsequently. So, Dan, why did you title your book 10% Happier? Is that a reasonable expectation? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, it, largely it's a joke because mm -hmm. uh, you can't quantify happiness. Um, but but I, I did it for two reasons. One, um, I'm trying to counter-program against the unrealistic uh, baloney, really, mm -hmm. that you hear in the self-help world where people tell you you can solve all of your problems through the power of positive thinking or whatever. So 10% happier, I, it's a joke, but it's kind of like a reasonable return on investment. And, it's not, and my point is not that 
you know, I started meditating and all of a sudden my life is a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. That's not the truth. However, I am happier, calmer, and nicer, and there's no, there's no question about it. And my level of happiness increases all the time. It's like the 10% kind of compounds annually. Um, the other reason why I did it is because of this, the PR problem that meditation has. And when I first started meditating, a lot of my very skeptical colleagues would say, why are you doing that? You know, like, what's the matter with you? It was almost like parenthetically they were asking, uh, have you joined a cult? And so I, I didn't know how to handle that question because it's hard to defend meditation because it is, you know, so seemingly weird. Um, so I started saying, oh, you know, it makes me about 10 percent happier. And I noticed when I said that, the look of scorn on people's face transformed um, to something approaching interest because I saw people saying, oh, you know, I, I, I'd like that. Uh, that sounds doable. And so I really stuck with it. Who are the people that are meditating now? It's not just the hippies anymore, is it? No, this is, but we're on the cusp of a big public health revolution. In, in the 1940s, if you went, if you told somebody, you know, I'm going running, they would say, they would have said to you, uh, who's chasing you? You know, nobody went running. But then the science showed that um, exercise was really good for you. And so now we have health clubs on every corner. The same thing is starting to happen with meditation. And I predict that within 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to be just as socially acceptable and maybe just as common as physical exercise. And, and uh, so now we're seeing it being done in a big way in the corporate world. Uh, CEOs and executives are doing it, including at places like Procter & Gamble, Aetna, Twitter, uh, General Mills, Google. Um, we're also seeing elite athletes do it. Novak Djokovic, who just won Wimbledon, is a meditator. The Seahawks, who won the Super Bowl, they meditate. Um, we're also seeing pop stars doing it from Katy Perry to 50 Cent. Uh, and most interestingly, members of the military, both the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Army, spending millions of dollars to study whether meditation can help with the epidemic of PTSD and also to make, make smarter, more effective, um, more thoughtful, um, less reactive warriors in the field. So this is coming down the pike. Uh, and my fondest hope is that I can somehow play a small role of catalyzing this, this public health revolution, which I think could really help a lot of people. Dan, before we run out of time, what is your advice to anyone that is wound tight, stressed out, depressed, and living with those constant voices? Well, let me address stress. Uh, well, first of all, it, for, let me before I address stress, let me address uh, depression and anxiety, because those are extremely common diagnoses in this country right now. Um, first of all, let me say you're not alone. I have suffered from depression and anxiety, and um, um, millions of others do, and I don't think you should feel isolated. Um, and uh, I, I don't think meditation is a miracle cure, but it has been shown in scientific studies, and this is the area where the studies are the strongest. It has been shown to really help. So consult your doctor, take your meds if they're prescribed, uh, do, the, do physical exercise, which is often really good for depression. Um, but consider meditation and talk to your doctor about it because the science is, you know, quite compelling that it can have a really salutary effect on anxiety and depression. So let me say this about stress. Uh, I think stress is actually a good thing to a certain extent. Now, I think anybody who's striving for excellence in any arena, be it uh, your profession, uh, parenting, volunteer work, uh, art, a certain amount of plotting and planning and striving is inherent in the enterprise. You just you need to worry a little bit if you're going to try to do something great or build something great. The problem is we often cross the line between what I call constructive anguish and useless rumination. And meditation for me has helped me get a, get a lot better at do it at not crossing that line. So I'm not making the suffering that is naturally part of life worse than it needs to be. And, uh, and I'm just doing the constructive worrying that ha helps me achieve my goal. The book is 10% Happier, How I Tame the Voice in My Head, Reduce Stress Without Losing My Edge, and Found Self-Help That Actually Works by Dan Harris. Dan, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing this important information. As I said, there are many type A people out there who are skeptics and don't believe that meditation can be for them. And I think it's great that you being recognized as quote unquote one of them can be an example of how it is possible to calm the mind and still be a player to achieve professional success. So thank you so much for being here. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for all of your kind words and thanks for having me out. We'll be right back.
Hi, this is Joan Herman, host of Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Did you know that Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life has a free monthly digital magazine that can be read online or emailed to your inbox? Every month, nationally recognized leaders in their field provide information to educate, inspire, and motivate you. We believe in a holistic approach to life, incorporating mind, body, and spirit. Check out a copy of Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life 24-7. Visit CYACYL.com and be sure to tell your friends. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided are the opinions of our guests and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, take part in the book club, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.